Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for sticking it out uh, to the end of the festival and having the good taste to come along to this uh, session. I'm Jez Nelson from Something Else. We're a business that makes loads of content and quite a lot of uh, audio experience. Before we start, just so we get a sense of kind of who you are and what you're interested in, how many people in the room listen regularly to podcasts or have ever listened to a podcast? That's pretty impressive. Anybody in the room make podcasts or make any kind of audio? Uh, and how many of you are sort of TV producers? Okay, a little bit of sense. Maybe we'll get some more uh, later on. If you have any questions, stick them uh, on, on the app. Uh, the running joke is, is it working? I think it is at the moment. So if you've got questions, and well, if they're, if they're decent enough, we'll pick them up as we go along, or maybe um, at the end. It feels quite, feel quite neat that the last session of the festival is actually about... Um, something that has no pictures whatsoever. But let's face it, some of the kind of best innovations uh, in content have always come from audio or radio as we uh, used to know it. But it's always been quite tricky to work out how you make any bloody money out of it, unless you're Chris Evans or, or Howard Stern. But these are kind of heady times uh, for audio and for people who produce uh, audio with Spotify coming into the market, Audible uh, as part of Amazon commissioning original programmes, more opportunities for indies who want to make radio for the BBC and brands increasingly getting into audio. But of course, the big thing is, is podcasting. Uh, it's been around for about 15 years. Uh, I think the BBC first published podcasts in 2006, but it's really over the last sort of, three or four years, it's really broken through in some of the major markets of the world. Uh, get some stats, some more stats in a moment, but I think 48 million people um, say that they download um, podcasts on a weekly basis in, in the US. Uh, Susie from ACAST will give us some UK figures in a moment. There are obviously some big hit podcasts out there from the US, Serial S Town, Caliphate, The Daily in the UK. My dad wrote a porno, Griefcast, Komodo Mayo, uh, Adam Buxton. And producers are, um, and talent are finding new ways to reach audiences and, and TV really is setting up and taking uh, notice, whether it's to develop new IP, exploit existing IP, or kind of expand and sweat their brands uh, in a new uh, medium. So joining me, uh, an amazing panel, actually. Um, some people who are, in their own way, are all big players in, in the podcast market. We have Susie Warhurst, who's the uh, Global Head of Content at ACAST, which is the world's fastest growing podcast platform. Jason Phipps, new into the job as the first ever commissioning editor of uh, podcasts at, at the BBC. Formerly, he uh, ran the audio business at The Guardian. And we have two genuine, uh, very different stars of the podcast world. Uh, Richard Herring, as well as being a, a veteran of UK comedy and of uh, Edinburgh, is also a real pioneer of podcasting. Did his first podcast 2008? Yeah. Um, and is about to clock up 200 episodes of his Leicester Square Theatre podcast. These have rightly earned him the title, The Podfather. Um, <laughs> and of course, My Dad Wrote a Porno has become a synonym for kind of box office smash uh, podcasting, as well as uh, achieving over 100 million downloads. There are books, merchandise, all kinds of stuff, some phenomenal um, live shows going on. James Cooper is one of the trio who hosts porno, as well as being an exec producer of original content at Shot Glass. So welcome all of you to uh, Edinburgh. Uh, we're going to play some little clips of your content as we go through. And in fact, we'll just start with um, a clip of My Dad Wrote a Porno. He grabbed her cervix. <gasps> oh. oh, no, I'm sorry. I feel... I have to say something here. He's going to kill her. <laughs> He's actually going to do some serious internal damage. And if we don't stop him, I don't know who will. Oh, my God. And he grabbed her dot, 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 boob, breast nipple, hand, hand <laughs> face, whatever. Grabbed her face. Better than cervix. <laughs> I don't think Rocky's the only one that's ignorant about the cervix. So I'm just going to Google for you really quick. Do you see that bracketed area? That's vagina. Yes, okay. it's like a map of the UK. Okay, that we have to deal with later. I can, I'll do geography next time. So, the cervix isn't part of the vagina, guys, okay? The cervix, as you can see, is almost grazing the lung. It's quite normal, the lady, okay? If you were talking about the UK, James, we'd be in Inverness, all right? Wow. So, James, let's start with you because porno is kind of 
the biggest podcast phenomena really in, in the UK of the last couple of years and one of the biggest globally as well. In case there are people here who don't know about it, very briefly, what is it? And tell us the kind of plot, the course of the last couple of incredible years. OK, um, my friend Jamie discovered his father had written an erotic novel. Uh, he brought it to the pub one day to share it with us and he read us the first chapter and it was so unbelievably bad we, we just couldn't stop laughing. We cleared the pub we were in, we kind of screamed with laughter and we decided we all work in the media. So Alice is obviously in radio and Jamie and I do TV stuff. So we kind of thought we need to do something with this. It's too good. Uh, and podcasting just felt like the kind of natural fit. We kind of decided we wanted to do a chapter, an episode. The idea is Jamie reads the chapter and then Alice and I kind of critique it and pull it apart. Uh, and yeah, it just felt like the best fit for the, the kind of format. And then, yeah, it just took off insanely quickly. Like, it was a real word of mouth thing. People seemed to tell their friends about it. Um, obviously, sex sells, who knew? Um, and then from that, it's kind of grown beyond our wildest dreams. So we just finished a world tour. Uh, we did a, a book that came out. We, yeah, like you said, we do merchandising and things. We're talking about TV shows and musicals. And <laughs> like, it's just become this kind of mad beast that none of us kind of really expected. And when you talk about live shows, I mean, People don't know Royal um, Ro Royal Albert Hall. Royal Albert Hall. Sydney Opera House. Yes. Um, and, it, <laughs> and if you look at so the, stupid. Co co <laughs> and it's three and, and the show is three people talking. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We do very little prep. Jamie literally the books are written, so Jamie just brings the book. We get the mics around the kitchen table, record for a couple of hours, and Jamie edits it down to about 30, 40 minutes. And uh, right, jobs are good. And we'll talk more about it later. But what would you put? Uh, you've, you've said it's about porn. Uh, what, why did it? Kind of take off so quickly. What was the, you know, how yeah, is it something? Know. Is it strategy? We, you're all media savvy, so did you have a strategy? Yeah, like Yeah, but we on? launched it like really quietly, and um, I don't know. Like, I, I guess Alice has a bit of a profile, so that helped get a bit some ears to it in the early days. But like I say, I feel like people really like when people find a podcast they like. I don't know. It feels like unique to this medium, but they really want to tell their friends about it, and they're like, "You've got to listen to this. You've got to listen to this." Um, so yeah, it was. It wasn't really. We weren't doing any PR. We just kind of put it out. And we were just really lucky that people found it and it kind of, it grew. Okay, well, we'll get in later, we'll get into it later on about, you know, why, considering you work in TV, you didn't think about first doing it in TV, why you went to podcasting. Um, Susie, you're head of content at Acast, which curates and hosts content. We'll talk in a moment about how that works, how you monetize podcasts. But first of all, give us a kind of quick sketch of the outline of the UK and global podcast market. Who's listening? How's it growing? Yeah, it's really hotting up, particularly... Um, US has led the way, New York is really the heart of the podcasting community, um, but the UK probably second market after that. In the UK now, 23% of Brits listen to podcasts every month, and of the new listeners, two thirds of them are 16 to 34 year olds, so it's the younger generation that are really discovering the genre and driving it forward. Um, I'd attribute that to a large degree to the content that is now flooding in. Um, back in the day, it, it, the content was very much uh, two white guys in a room chatting about football or tech. Um, that's totally changed now. There's all kinds of formats emerging, far more women, far more diversity. Um, people have got smart about how to market and grow that content. And the technology has made it far easier. Um, Apple Podcasts putting that, their app in the, in the iPhone was a game changer in 2014. Um, but now there's so many different ways to listen and some of the barriers have, have been broken down. So it's, it's hugely exciting. Um, so it really does feel like a boom for podcasting. And, and, and by its nature, it's immediately available globally. Podca podcast. So well, what are the big markets for podcasts? US, UK, Canada, Australia. Um, after that, heading into Europe, although those markets, um, there's, there's, there's less domestic content at the moment. So it's English speaking countries that are leading the way. Uh, for now, that will change. That will change. I think uh, also countries like India, Brazil, uh, will see huge growth coming from from those markets. But yeah, Richard, as I said, you're you're genuinely sort of a pioneer in this area in a way. And I mean, we'll talk in a mo moment about sort of the different ways of monetizing things. But I mean, you you really it's been a whole phase of your career has really been led off the back of podcasting. So yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I sort of. You know, I'd been done, done TV shows in the '90s, done some writing in the early 2000s, and I was doing I was doing stand-up shows, and touring them, and uh, and getting some work on radio and telly. But it was increasingly difficult to get. You know, it just felt like a long time to get a show made, and then people would interfere and change it, or it wouldn't be put out. And so, just the idea that you could put your own thing out just 
uh, appealed to me. I found out how easy it was. And, you know, me and Andrew Collins, uh, the br- journalist and broadcaster, just we used to do a six music show, and we said, and he, he said, hey, you just take, need a computer and someone to put it up, and we can chat. So we just thought it'd be a fun thing to do. We I think we thought like maybe someone would listen to it and give us a radio show. <laughs> I think that's, that was right. about the limit of our ambition early on. But I just we just thought it'd be a fun thing to do, um, and I kind of realised very quickly that people coming to my live shows and saying, oh, I love the podcast and my audience was getting bigger. And so very early on, people said, why are you doing this? You're not getting paid to do it. It seems insane. And it was partly just that autonomy that you have as a stand up. Uh, it was just I was sick of waiting to get stuff out there and just the immediacy of it was so fantastic that we literally recorded a podcast and put it up straight away. We didn't edit it. We didn't do We just talked for an hour and six minutes because that's when the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the software stopped. <laughs> so it just stopped at one hour six minutes uh, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Apple Mac. Uh, we just put it all out, you know, and then I think because we were one of the first ones. They were obviously, they have been going a little while, and I think Ricky Gervais had been doing one, um, and a couple of my friends were, were doing a podcast as well. But um, I just, I just like that, you know, it was, it was like Wild West. It was like we were starting something out, and the money didn't, it didn't even think, it didn't care about the money. But like within three or four years, I just sort of realised this is like a very canny business decision anyway because you've got you know 100,000 50,000 25,000 people listening to you every week if you then go I'm going on tour and I'm coming to your town chances are 10 of them will come and see your show you know so it it, it paid off in monetary terms almost straight away as, as okay well. and we'll talk in a moment about more some of the sort of direct ways that you actually because it's all about very direct relationships with the audience and that can involve actually asking them uh, for money um, Jason where does the BBC fit into this then because I mean you've already got this you know publicly funded large portfolio of radio networks, terrestrial, digital, you've got websites with audio, listen again, downloadable programmes. Why do you think you have to be in podcasting as well? Well, I mean, I think, um, I think the reason why they gave me the job is that I sort of fairly convincingly argued that um, podcasts have evolved their own particularities and that um, they've, they've broken away from radio, they differ from radio, so um, my dad wrote a porno wouldn't have existed in, in a sense on a radio network, it needed that space, it needed that kind of access, that sort of hyper intimacy because people listen on headphones, um, I mean I can tell you why it's so successful because it's about friendship fundamentally, it's actually about a great friendship and, and all the other stuff is just wit and humour and it allows people in and so podcasts seem to be able to do that in a way that um, sh- absolutely radio can do but it, it, it does it in a, at a different sort of at a different remove uh, it does it around you know broadcasting to state the obvious is a speaker in the middle of the room so therefore tonally you can't talk about things you can't use language in the way you fucking want to use language <laughs> and you can't speak and and podcasts enter this kind of real language into it and I mean that's the sort of mark of I think what Richard did essentially is kind of like real conversations like genuine the stuff that you want to hear in a pub when people are sitting next to you great great conversations but why can't you do that i mean my question is really so this is stuff because the bbc have got a long history of doing podcasts 2006 yeah. or whatever but really they had all this kind of archaic policy around it had to be broadcast first and then it could become a podcast so it's kind of radio shows which were then turned into podcasts and we make the komodo Wait. mayo show and you stick a few yeah. extra bits on but your job is different because you're now yeah. looking for stuff which is podcast first and you don't have to think about no. broadcast no in fact and i've been brought in to sort of like uh, not replicate essentially just find areas where the, the network identities don't allow for a particular kind of uh, content proposition for a younger audience is definitely my, my role is attached to the sounds app really and I'm commissioning there for that 16 to 34 audience where there's a big growth in that area. Right. So sounds app is a new app which is going to ultimately replace the iPlayer. It's basically the radio it's, iPlayer. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of a long term proposition for the BBC and it's a much, much more cohesive um, place where all the linear, all the music propositions and all the speech podcast propositions can live. Uh, and I, I, my team curate and sort of look at that. We okay. run that aspect of, of the Sounds app. All right, we'll get more into what it is you're actually looking for in sort of the editorial brief. Um, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the kind of creative freedom and, you know, that process. But I did want to sort of deal with the with the money thing up front um, uh, because, you know, it's, it's important and you know, for, for producers, it's a new way of thinking about direct, you know, revenue streams and obviously for sort of talent too. James, you must be absolutely coining it at the, <laughs> at the moment, right? I mean, massive gigs, 
<laughs> look on the website. You're selling, I don't know, T-shirts, mugs, uh, everything. You've got a book. There's, I know there's talk of t TV. What, so what are the c key kind of revenue sources? How does it, how does it break? I don't expect to give me details, but what are, you know, how does it yeah, break yeah. down? Um, well, the sponsorship around the podcast, obviously, is a big one for us. We do sponsor reads and ad insertion as well. And working with ACAST, they slot in new sponsor reads all the time so we can be monetizing the back catalogue. And an accident, but a great accident of our show is, is a narrative. So you have to start at the beginning. You don't just dip in. So we kind of are continually monetizing those listens, which is great. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, yeah, we did the book. The touring, obviously, is, is, a, is a great one. Um, well, how else do we monetize the show? Merch. Merch. Licensing. We've just put our podcast on a plane, on Virgin Atlantic planes. So we did a licensing deal there. Um, we, uh, and then obviously like the bigger conversations about TV and things like that. And so, yeah. And the beauty of, of it is it's, it's such a cheap f format, right? I mean, maybe you're expensive. It's but peanuts. <laughs> we, don't, we don't spend anything making it. Yeah, we bought yeah. some mics and we record on GarageBand. Oh, it's honestly so low rent, I can't tell you. Like we record on GarageBand, edit in Premiere, which is video editing software. Um, so yeah, we do it really on the cheap. I mean, again, don't expect to go into detail, but you're used to working in television. Are you making the kind of money from this now that you would make if you were making a big hit TV show? I mean, in terms of profit and what you get out of it. We're, are we are, uh, yeah, we're, uh, it, we're starting to see, especially this year with everything we've been doing, we're starting to, like, to see that this could be like our careers, basically. And this is money we could, we could live on, potentially. So right. it's, yeah. Fantastic. And so, so Susie, uh, Paul knows with you, as many uh, you know, podcasts are, explain the different types of model then and how, how do you, sponsors, advertising, in some ways it's quite old fashioned radio stuff, isn't it? The, um, the, the sort of media sales bit. In some ways, yeah. Uh, so the traditional model in podcasting was always the host read. So having the host of a podcast endorse a product. So if you listen to lots of shows, you'll be familiar with this. This is your, your mattresses, your Hello mm -hmm. Freshes, your Blue Aprons. It's those guys, the direct response. That's the traditional model. That's very popular, especially in America. Um, the big move now is to move towards far bigger budgets from brand advertisers through the major agencies. So that still could come in the form of a host read, but more often with um, publishers, like we work with The Guardian, the FT, The Economist, The Times, it's not appropriate for them to have their hosts endorsing a mattress. Absolutely inappropriate. So having um, a different narrator style read can work, and we can still charge extremely high CPMs. Podcastings charge charges the highest premium on digital audio, um, way, way beyond commercial radio. There's a reason for that. It's an incredibly engaged audience. You're listening at a point when you're in a great mood usually, you have your headphones in, you're very loyal to your host. Um, so it's a powerful place for advertisers to be. Um, we also sell 30 second spot ads. That's the kind of thing you'd hear on Spotify if you didn't pay for your premium or commercial radio. More and more we're trying to encourage advertisers to think about podcast ads, not radio ads. Podcasting is not about being as shouty, much more intimate, um, and that's something we're pushing for um, to improve the quality of advertising in, in podcasting. But all the ads get geo-targeted, so a show like Porno will have campaigns running in, different campaigns running in Australia, US, UK, Ireland, all at the same time. Um, so there's a real flexibility there uh, for the advertisers who don't necessarily want to buy 100% of your global audience. They just want to reach the people that that fits their campaign and their campaign dates. Because it's dynamic, we can, we can fit those campaign dates and track it. And, what, track. and what's the stuff that people, the advertisers really want to be around? Because we were talking last night about some of the sort of stuff you think, oh, it'd be a big hit, but actually advertisers don't yeah. want to touch it, don't want to be around death or yeah. murder necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think James would attest to the fact that in the early days of porno, it was quite difficult actually going to the agencies and saying, hey, do you want to buy this smut, you know? <laughs> Funnily enough, it was, it was a little challenging. They've gone beyond that now. Porno is a mainstream show. People get it's entertainment, it's comedy. It's, it's not, it, yes, it's sexual content, but that isn't the focus. So um, the industry's moved on. It's more trusting. It's ready to take gambles. But I'd say as well, we work quite well with advertisers to help them understand that podcasting isn't the same as everywhere else. So, for example, Adam Buxton, who we work very closely with, he has a particular style. He does his jingles. If you don't like them, he's not the show for you. And that, that's, the, that's the way he works. So we deal with a lot of talent who want to you know, control the types and format of the ads. And it's, um, it can work really, really well. So, I mean, as an, as an audio producer, having been doing it, for a long doing it for a long time, it's been quite 
we love the BBC, but it's effectively been a kind of mon monopoly. And all of a sudden, there's all these other places we can, you know, we love working with Audible, with Spotify. You've got to do stuff direct to market. So the BBC, in terms of making money out the BBC, uh, is it an old-fashioned model? It's basically we come along to you with an idea, and you'll pay us a fee, and that's it. There's no. Can we? Is there any commercial opportunity beyond that with the BBC? Um, I mean. I mean, I'm two months in the game, so I don't, I don't have everything tied down exactly. Yeah. But just to say that I think the BBC wants to be a fully functioning player in a fully functioning market. I've been saying to people in the BBC, like, one of the things I, I don't have to sort of... I, I'm not a monopolist. Like, I, if ideas come to me, they essentially don't die. They can have a life. They can go somewhere else. They can find another backer. They can grow organically. I mean, and that's a whole challenge, just like these guys did. Um, there's, there's so many different ways to build a, a great idea in, into something big. And uh, I think for, for ideas that fit our strategy and fit public service and BBC values, then we're the best partner for that. And so, yeah, we, we want to be a kind of a reasonable person. I mean, I, th I think actually as, as a commissioner, we'll be almost like you know, best practice in some sense. I mean, I, I know that from my own experience, which is, you know, a lot of other, uh, pro, you know, commissioners in the area, um, you know, publishers in the area, particularly the Americans, come with, you know, with quite a sort of high ask in terms of ownership and exploitation of IP. It isn't always the simplest thing. It's great to see panoplies and great to see all those Americans come over and be in town, but, you know, they're quite hard-nosed about it. And because the market is so advanced over there and it's so busy, they, they can call the shots in some ways. It's kind of analogous to Netflix, or whatever. So I think the BBC will be a reasonable, you know, a good player and best practice in the market when it comes How to... How are you going to get the really sort of exciting mainstream stuff that I'm sure you want? I mean, if you're... Because why would James or Richard, for that matter, come to you if they thought they had a really commercial idea? And I mean, maybe there's a tension because you don't want him to have that because you want to sell advertising around him. But why? Why would why why would you do that? Because there'll be all the old-fashioned yeah. BBC restrictions around commercialising it and all of that stuff. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, one that's a moving target. I mean, there are sort of things that we have to sort of abide by is public money and uh, sure there's a ton of hoops but that doesn't mean I mean I think it's analogous to television I, th I actually think podcasting is much more close to television um, than radio in some ways and and the BBC it does deals all the time you know is is a really good benefactor for the the, the indie sector and TV uh, you know li effectively licenses and develops uh, IP but does is also a, a kind of a collaborative player in the growth of products around that and I, I would see that as, as kind of closer to the what, what I would like the kind of podcast commissioning to look like in the BBC really good players really good collaborators and and, and actually I think to some extent the kind of chin stroking podcasty millennial cliche millennial is overserved and I, I actually don't think we have enough of my dad wrote a pornos I don't I think we need more Love Islands more of those big big brash, intelligent, clever, warm uh, uh, content experiences for bigger audiences because we're, we're, not, we're growing, but we're not growing fast enough. We could grow faster. It could be bigger. It will be bigger. And those audiences need programs that feel kind of appropriate. It's interesting. So very clearly, because I think a lot of people might have thought when they heard about your job that you might be going in that direction of high quality drama or all, you know, em, you know emulating serial, that kind of stuff. But actually you're targeting young people and you would love a, the equivalent of a porno you want big mainstream yeah I would you want I, big I would mainstream. yeah I mean I do I do want a serial as well I'd like yeah. to have a bit of everything and I do want high quality drama I mean drama is is a particular issue I think in this in this space because it's very early days and yeah. we can see how exciting it is in, in the US and what's happening but um, it does seem incredible uh, like we pr the BBC is probably the biggest radio drama producer in the world and therefore not to have a really creative dynamic proposition in that world seems nuts and everyone in the BBC realises that so th yeah I mean th there will be interesting and are you comfortable with this Suda? I mean is this the BBC yeah. doing is, yeah. should they be doing this absolutely Going, yeah. yeah it's so important for the industry and um, I it's the, it's the only way to, to keep lifting up the quality of the content, to create diversity here. It's, it's a challenge in the UK still for new podcasters with really creative ideas to, to get them off the ground and, and grow them and give them global impact. Um, you know, at ACAS, we help 
help as far as we can, but having someone in the, in the BBC commission really fantastic British content is going to benefit everybody. Okay. That's so Richard, you, 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 you don't go through a cast. You've got, no. um, you, so I'm, you're all about the audience. I get that. And the audience, you go to the show, everybody knows. I mean, I went to the show of the Bugle the other night here and everybody knows every joke and it's in, but you're, you've got an incredibly intimate relationship with your, with your audience to the fact, to the, to the extent where you, you, you don't have advertising and you actually directly fund the sometimes. Well, yeah, it's changing a little bit, but yeah, basically, I was very resistant to, um, you know, the whole point of doing podcast to me early on was that autonomy was getting rid of the gatekeepers, was going, I've got a great idea. And most of those great ideas, you know, there's some great ideas you can't do without a broadcast or without a huge amount of money behind you. And I'm very interested in exploiting, you know, I, I working with other people, but also trying to raise enough money to make much more adventurous stuff, which we've done in different ways. But, I, you know, I just thought, A, you've got that, yeah, you're building up a relationship with people. Obviously, it's taken me 10 years. Um, but when people have listened to you for five years and you say... Uh, how about giving a pound a month to, for us to keep making more podcasts? We, we only tried to cover our costs to begin. We started filming the Less Square Theatre podcast and that was costing us about two or three thousand pounds an episode. And obviously I didn't want to lose two or three thousand pounds an episode. So we tried to get people to pay to, to, you know, to rent them to begin or to buy them to begin with. And then we realised that that was a bit of law of diminishing returns. And so then we did the Kickstarter thing was a big thing. You know, we, we have probably raised three or four hundred thousand pounds through kickstarter over the last four or five years for various projects um and people will kick in because you're giving them a free podcast every week and then um so some people we pay a pound a month some people we start doing a, a slight patreon thing with um called drip with kickstarter which is doing all right but not uh, it doesn't really make much that much difference uh, and then I'll just do a kickstart every now and again. But yeah, but as I, you know, I own the idea. I, and, and so like if some, if the right thing comes along, I'll sometimes, with Bulb, uh, which is a renewable energy company, which I really like, which I would have promoted for nothing. They said they, they give you 50 pounds for every person who subscribes via your link and the person gets 50 pounds <laughs> and gets cheaper bills and gets renewable energy. And it sort of seems like a dream situation where mm. everyone's getting something and nobody's paying anything and everyone's saving money uh, and doing something good. And you know, that's raised quite a lot of money and I'm doing, uh, I've got a sponsorship with Beer 52 for the next round of podcasts, uh, which again, I feel like I can do it because I can just have a beer during the podcast and that's, uh, it's not too intrusive. Um, and uh, you know, so there are ways. But by waiting and wait, I you know, I'm sort of at the position where the, the those sponsors are coming to me, and if I feel they're the right fit for it, I might include them in it because I'd rather people didn't got it for, for nothing. But it's but it is also really nice that it's a fan supported thing as well. But you know, I would like to make sitcoms. I'd like to make films. I'd like to do you know that kind of I have that kind of budget. And I think realistically, actually, yeah, talking to Adam made me realise that realistically. I think you probably, if, you, if you've got, you know, bigger vision for it. But as I say, you know, in the early days, it was just, it made, this, A, it rescued my career, I think. I wasn't, the, you know, the, I was getting bits of tip tally, bits of radio, but not much. The minute I sort of podcast thing, I started getting panel shows and things like that for a little while. But also just, it meant that I can tour and, you know, 300 people come see me rather than 100 people come see me and that, that difference in, in yeah. revenue is a huge amount of money. So if you're, I think as a, if you're a creative person, as a performer, you're the product. And I kind of did think very early on, if someone's, someone offered me 10,000 pounds to, to, to promote, to be, have, be promoted on three podcasts. And I thought if it's worth 10,000 or $10,000, I thought if it's worth $10,000 to you, it's got to, I'm the product. It's got to be worth more than $10,000 to me. So why am I advertising you? You know, so I think that if you're the creative person and you're create, you, you want to get rid of those gatekeepers and you don't, you know, I think the problem with sponsorship is if, you know, you want to do, if you want to, what I loved about podcasts straight away was you could say whatever you wanted and be as rude as you wanted was going through the BBC was just at that point where Jonathan Ross and Russell Brand had done something naughty and were being very worried about stuff and being able to just go and do a podcast where I could say whatever I wanted was an amazing freedom. Um, but like if you've, got a, if you've got a sponsor and you say something naughty, they might go, oh, we're not giving right. you any money for this or, you know, we're, we're withdrawing our sponsorship. So, you know, that autonomy is sort of still more important to me. OK, well, come on, talk some more about that. Let's hear a, let's hear a clip then. So um, I don't know if you want to set this up, Richard, because it, uh, it sort of sounds in its own right, but you might want to explain the context. It's well, David Mitchell and you... Well, yeah, well, I mean, basically my podcast, uh, the, the main one I'm doing, the Richard and Les Square podcast, is me just chatting with comedians. And sometimes it's an interview and sometimes it's two people messing around. I have a thing called Emergency Questions, which has kind of come up accidentally, which again is, you know, is, is quite a nice idea in itself. But it's just I ask dumb and childish questions and people have to cope with it. And David is the best at... 
I mean, I'm sort of trying to embarrass people and upset people <laughs> and, and make them think about things they haven't thought about before. And you've chosen this particular clip that I don't remember happening. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's very childish. If you could have sex with any, the ghost of any person who's dead, yeah. which person would you like to have sex if, if, if your wife, well, no, I was going to say if your wife was sadly dead, but then you might want to have sex with her because she'd be a ghost. Mm. So your wife is being kidnapped by uh, a gang yeah. Yeah. for a long time. Yeah. She's been away for a long time. It's taking a weird turn. It's just saying, which, which historical character would you most like to have sex with if you were in the position to do that, if they were still alive? Um, I, th I think I don't know. I mean, I think probably a, like a really probably just like a someone like Grace Kelly. She's very sexy. Okay. I mean, it wouldn't be. She's not historically interesting. No. I'd rather meet Napoleon. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> I, right. I don't know. The question would be: if you can only meet these historical figures by having sex yeah. with them, would, would I be willing, willing to endure <laughs> sex with Napoleon in order to meet such an interesting historical figure? <laughs> Or, you know, going back to Henry VIII, of yeah. course, you've got the risk of venereal disease. <laughs> yeah. Would it be? But then again, syphilis can be quite easily treated now. now. As long as so you get, back you get to meet Henry VIII, interesting man. <laughs> you, you end up bringing syphilis back from the 16th century. That's downside. Yeah. Or, or do you just go, Grace Kelly, film star, yeah. you know, that'd be fine. It's allowed, apparently, because she's a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But weirdly, by asking stupid questions like yeah. that, you then... The, the people haven't. I think the problem with interviews, everyone gets asked the same questions all the yeah. time, and so because he's never been asked that before, a it leads to an interesting place, but also opens the creative mind in a different direction, and you end up getting some interesting stuff out of people that I don't think you'd get as yeah. a result. So and it's accidental. Again, most of my stuff is accidental, but it's, it's turned out to be quite a clever interview technique. And it's good because you get to see the sort of workings of comedians' brains, yeah. and you see it on the kind of panel shows. But it's half an hour; it's all quite edited and condensed. But you kind of see clever comedians bringing things yeah, back. Yeah, you know, and that's what I think about panel panel shows is when you do them they do three hours and it's lots of great stuff in it then they edit it down and they cut out half the f things that make the end joke funny anyway so you know it's to be able to see it's real I leave the failures in as well if something if a, if yeah. a, if a question's embarrassing or someone does I d ask that stupid question and fall over myself and the person goes <laughs> I don't know I leave it in because it makes the good stuff look genuine because it is so, yeah. so when you manage to kind of riff that you know that's not something I think David's thought about before yeah. Uh, but we've got, no, we got something. <laughs> we well, got actually, if you listen to the full thing, I think he has. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so, so yeah, you could sort of hear that clip in isolation on a BBC show. But as you say, it's the kind of length thing. But you just just get onto a. Us all talking about editorial freedom, uh, having done lots of stuff at the BBC. I mean, clump compliance, right? I mean, do you even? Th you said to me the other day, "Oh, I can't remember anything. Just choose a clip. I don't yeah. listen back." I mean, do, do you have to worry about that? All stuff? we do is at the end of each podcast, we'll say to the guest, "Is there anything you want us to cut out of it?" I mean, obviously, the, there's an audience there, so things are out there, and sometimes journalists are in the audience, so you're not kind of completely free. But if some, it, it's so loose and you forget it's being recorded because it's a long form interview, you don't really do this anywhere. Uh, and, and sometimes we're having such a good time, people really spill a secret they shouldn't spill or right. say something about something they shouldn't say. So we'll cut that. My producer, Ben Walker, does so think a little bit about libel and stuff now. See, we don't lawyer. I mean, no, we don't have lawyers. We no. just we just make it. And and, I, and to be honest, if someone was to go back through everything I've done online, I would probably be sent to prison. <laughs> uh, but certainly, you know, certainly somebody would would be in a position to sue me or you know for, for things I've said yeah. that are, as jokes. So, um, so is it but there's just so much of it that no one could. Is do it that. sort of genuinely liberating? It was. It was. Early, it was. It in, was. Early in your career, you were in the constraints right. of. I did. Uh, I did a sketch, stand up a sketch, sketch show called As It Occurs to Me. The whole point was I can do anything I want. I did about you know, and we did it every and I wrote every week very quickly. Within about three weeks, you went. Oh, it kind of is, you know, it's kind of not that much fun to be able to do whatever you want when you're allowed to do whatever you want. So it kind of, you find your own, you know, you're allowed to be as rude as you want, but it kind of settles down. You go way up and then you go, actually, there's a reason those boundaries are there. And it's because yeah. the stuff on the other side isn't that funny. <laughs> or, you know, it's only funny if you're transgressing some, some rule, you know. So if you have no rules, then comedy changes in its own way. So it's just nice to have that freedom. It was the autonomy of it just... It was just the immediacy and the autonomy were the things that really appealed to me more than anything. That was worth more than anything to me. Uh, and I've been able to make, uh, you know, we did, as it occurs to me, we could raise 100 grand on Kickstarter to make a six-part stand-up and sketch show, which, again, is not enough money to do it, really. But we, we, knock, we knocked something together that I was quite pleased with. But, you know, that's, I think it's, it feels like the early days of the film industry to me, you know, when Charlie Chapman was out kicking out these 
you know, these short, these silent shorts and then he had the idea of charging everyone one P to or five yeah. cents to come and see him. And within two years, he was a millionaire. And that's, I mean, it's happening. I mean, it's happening now that that's, that's where we're at. You own the idea. You don't have to worry about anybody else coming in. And then people are interested in coming in and saying, hey, I'd like to help you make some money from this. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So J James, there you were sitting in the pub, two TV producers mm -hmm. and someone who's a, you know, a, a presenter, TV and radio. So you said earlier on, I think you said, you immediately said podcasting, right? Yeah. But so so would, could you ever imagine at that time of got, getting that idea away on TV? No way, no. I think, and also, yeah, that was kind of the, one of the main drivers. We were like, we can't take this anywhere. No one's going to touch the content. Um, the title alone, everyone was like, no, no, no. Um, so, yeah, we just decided to kind of go it alone. And we did have conversations, like, you know, we did develop it. We didn't just start doing it. We did develop the format what format there is um, and think about our branding and, and we're really careful that when we started we were started properly and it felt like a thing um, yeah so I mean do you is, is, is there a, you spend your time it sounds like you may be soon able to free yourself of the shackles of going in to see commissioning editors and trying <laughs> to sell your wares but, um, but do, do you is, is it a fault of television that you think that they couldn't buy an idea like that is it is it you know is there something they well, can learn i guess from the, from from the way that clever people talented people are just coming up with ideas and trying them out in podcasting was it all too expensive tv to do that yeah it's too risky i guess like with ours it was so low cost and we were just kind of doing it off our own backs because you know me and jamie were literally nobody and alice has a profile like i can see why they wouldn't have like the content was so extreme um i can see why they didn't go for it um but it's, podcasting is also a nice space to be able to try new things and experiment. And then, you know, if, if it proves to be successful in that medium, then it's a good opportunity to take it to television or to take it elsewhere. So, And I think TV commissions are constrained by worrying about, is this going to make enough, is it going to be successful enough to yeah. money back? They're, you know, they're looking, I, I think, with, certainly in comedy terms, I think TV commissions now kind of, in the old days, they would just do basically what is podcasting. They'd say to Monty Python, OK, we like you. Go and here's some money. Go and make a show. And now everything's so carefully, mm. you know, police right from the start. The last TV meeting I had was a disaster because the people were people who've never written anything were telling me how to write a sitcom. And, and I was just thought it was the rudest thing I've ever been faced with. And so we basically ended the meeting. So it was, you know, I, you've got to trust the people you think are good. Listening to podcasts is a good way of finding out whether they are. But yeah, that's it. No one would do that. I do a podcast where I play myself at snooker and commentate on it in audio format. And I'm not very good at snooker and I don't really understand the rules and I can't really commentate on it. No one's going to commission that. They're right not to. <laughs> but I'm still able to do it because of the internet and, and 5,000 people will listen to it. But also right. in my day job, we're now using podcasts to, yeah, like to test formats, to test talents, to bring an audience to, them, to grow them so that they are then in a position where you could take them to a, a commissioner for something yeah. else. OK, we'll definitely talk about more about that in a moment. Um, Jason, we're going we're to hear your uh, sort of reel here and, and then maybe hear a little bit more about what it is you're actually looking for, you're actively commissioning. Is there anything you want to say to set this up before? Because this is all... Um, I didn't commission any of the no. stuff you're going to... Well, no, I mean, that's not... It's great. I just, it just, it's just to point out that, you know, um, I've, I've landed in, in a place where this kind of revolution, in a sense, has already sort of begun and it's much broader than me uh, and it, it's taking place in lots of the networks in Radio 1, in, in Radio 4. So there's a lot of creativity. It's, 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 an, it's an amazing time, I think, to be in the BBC. I think a lot of people assume from the <coughs> outside that it's, it's all about, you know, it's W1A and people just checking boxes and stuff like that. That's there too, emphatically. <laughs> But fundamentally, it's full of in incredibly passionate, uh, adventurous people who are trying not to see, that, that, you know, are trying to look at the rules as a way to, to do great stuff and stretch the boundaries creatively, not, not, not just to sort of like stay in a safe place. Okay, let's have a listen to them. From Wrexham, I've got a friend called Jamie, who was my best pal, and he still is. We've got a guy called Nutty as well. Was he doing Nutty? He's, he's a taxi driver. Oh. Yeah. But these are my best friends from school, and I know if I broke down in the middle of nowhere, Jamie and Nutty would be the well, we'll one to a taxi thing. driver. Yeah, yeah. Of course he would. Come on, Nick. You'd be on the meter. Sea otters, sea pens, sea cucumbers, spider crabs, Garibaldi fish, fursy and shark, a torpedo ray, a common octopus, stingray. He's going to have to use trickery. Yeah, 
Can you imagine anyone else being able to lend such gravitas? Magic. This is Evil Genius, where we take your beloved heroes from history and fling their own mud at them until they are weighed down in dirty truths. Or not. Because that's what we're asking today. When you weigh up the scales of achievement on one side and total dickhead on the other, which way will it tip? Evil? Or genius? That's where license fee money goes, into that device right there. Each week we take a topic from the adult world that we're struggling to get our heads around and we look to the grown-up land of Radio 4 for answers and advice. This week we're looking at the future. Do, do, do. Great sting there, Bishop. Thank you. <laughs> Is that the sound of the future? Yeah. Just three monotone notes. <laughs> yeah. do, do. Get ready, it's hype. Where I see it is you, you had a long phase when you had this period, as I said earlier on, where you had kind of radio shows, which then turned into podcasts. You've had this interim phase where you've kind of got radio producers trying out podcasting ideas, maybe, and now you're here, and it's a whole new era. So who do you want to work with, and what kind of ideas are you, are you looking for? So we've tried to, I mean, uh, I have a commissioning, a series of commissioning rounds imminent, so people can literally just go on the commissioning website, all the, uh, and I'm looking for a broader range of, of partners. I think, I think podcasting and the BBC commissioning of podcasting offers a sort of a, a broader family of creative partnerships. So for instance, arguably, I'm from The Guardian, you know, The Guardian has a richer tradition of podcasts than the BBC in some sense, because we've been in the game for so long. Um, Telegraph has an incredible audio team, you know, uh, Penguin Random House have a killer audio team and all these uh, sort of uh, legacy print, legacy uh, newspaper industries have built a real proposition there and therefore I, I, I would like to think that, you know, th these commissions can open up not just exclusively to the indie radio sector and then the indie, indie radio sector itself has gone through, and I mean you know that better than anyone, Jez, which is like rejuvenate, rejuvenating its proposition, trying to hire different kinds of producers, younger producers. Um, there's a, you know, a flurry of money in brand partnership stuff, and I mean, Susie can talk about that. It's quite a kind of bubbly, buoyant space to be in, 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 sort of in terms of producing podcasts for the indie radio sector. But um, essentially, I'm, I've got four key areas, and they're kind of strangely kind of general. That's because, as, as I, I've talked before, which is podcasting is, is a genre bending form, basically. The, the, the reason why a lot of the TV companies wouldn't have commissioned what, uh, Richard you know, and James here is just because it would have messed with their idea of what fits into what box. And therefore, we've constructed a kind of creative ask um, which is essentially uh, funny, quirky, odd, which is a kind of like a play on comedy, but it doesn't, you know, it has to take humor and do something interesting in the, in the kind of comedy humor space. Um, uh, narrative storytelling, so we realize that podcasts are incredible at telling big, dramatic stories, and that could be fiction and nonfiction. I mean, I'd play Serial alongside Homecoming there, you know, there's just, so they, you know, in the same kind of commissioning area, we, we would, I would meet drama commissioners or drama uh, creators and I would meet investigative journalists. Uh, and then we have a kind of a space that we're commissioning around um, discover and explain. And we can all see what's happening with these kind of high value uh, daily news propositions. You know, the video explainer has trans is mutated into a really interesting sort of product in audio, which we broadly call narrative news, which is just like, it's stealing lots of stuff from TV and documentary and they're much more heightened, focused, rich propositions in terms of like those big studies of events, current affairs. That's one area. And then the final area is subcultures and pop cultures, because as you've just heard, it's a great place to hear new voices, you know, is to, to sort of, or hear new takes on things that we all love, big, big popular cultural moments. And, and we're going to be looking in, in that area as well. So there'll be four essential sort of propositions where I think we've tried to create a broad but specific ask from the creative community to sort of like pitch for money. And what, what I learned um, from you chatting earlier was, uh, was quite interesting is that you, you might actually also go out and look at existing properties yeah. and try and lure them to the BBC to, to develop them, right? Or yeah, I mean, that's a particularly creative challenge because it's also about asking established brands in that space to do something with us that's different. So like, I, there's no point, we're not going to go out and buy these guys. It wouldn't make any sense. It has its own, it would destroy the very thing that created it. So that's not what we're sort of striving Richard's to do. Richard's snooker idea might be for sale. Yeah, <laughs> Richard, you can buy that. It's a million, a million quid. <laughs> Done. Done. Um, but, but, but I do think, yeah, as a, as a sort of, a, as an interesting public service 
commissioner in the space, I think we can do things that are very interesting that take the best aspects of, of the kind of creative teams that are, are already knocking it out of the park and, and, do, and, and, and do a twist on it. Okay, we'll finish off in a moment with a section about kind of the big lessons that TV can perhaps learn from, from podcasting. And there's a lot of kind of, you know, heat about that at the moment. Um, but Susie, um, let's talk about um, Love Island. Let's, let's Because yeah. it's a big, it's been a big sort of breakthrough it's moment, obviously in, in general in terms of it's really cracked the cross-platform thing in a way that nothing else has. Yeah. And the podcast has been a, you know, important part of that. summer, yeah. Number one across Apple Podcasts for pretty much the whole summer. Um, for Phenomenal success. Um, didn't surprise me too much actually because it's perfect audience-wise. It's it's that younger generation, the 16 to 34. Um, very reactionary. They had it up overnight, so it was ready to go first thing in the morning. So you watch Love Island the night before. You want to talk about it. You want to get the sense of the gossip. It was very well produced, um, well marketed, and um, yeah, fantastic. And it's sort of, uh, I guess it's enabled, uh, you know, a big telly brand to sort of kind of extend yep. in a way that no, no, no one's really done that yet. Yep. In fact, it was one of three podcasts from ITV this summer that we hosted. They also did a, a World Cup show and a Tour de France podcast. Um, so ITV, I think, can see the value here. Um, it's sort of extending the brand, really building that engagement, capitalising on social media, which is where a lot of people who listen to podcasts um, interact with each other. Um, yeah, I think for TV companies, there's an enormous opportunity. One, sort of extend existing brands. Um, and get sponsorship. This podcast was sponsored by Kellogg's, which is a phenomenal brand to bring into the podcasting space. Um, but also to look at testing new formats, a place to develop IP, kind of as James was talking about. Um, and I think that's a really, TV can bring an awful lot to podcasting, an awful lot. What are the, what are the numbers like on this? Can you tell us? Yeah, uh, so we um, we published them actually. It's three million over the whole series. Three million downloads. So that's a there's a good lot yeah. of it. So how, how many ep episodes were there? So it was one a day yeah. across the whole series. So quite a lot. So that's 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 very significant. Let's hear a, um, the clip. Love Island, the morning after. Sponsored by Kellogg's Corn Flakes. We are seven weeks in and heads are still being turned. You're listening to The Morning After, the official Love Island podcast with me, Ariel Free. And joining me in the studio is Dev from Radio 1. Hey. How you doing? Um, I'm a little bit exhausted. Actually, after watching last night's episode, I just, I'm, I'm traumatised. I'm emotionally drained. I just don't know what to believe anymore. You were doing gymnastics, and we'll get to that in a minute. But coming up in today's podcast... Jack and Laura split up. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. I just, I'm so gutted for her. Alex Squares' relationship looks like it's in the balance and the saga of Georgia and Sam reels on. First up, though, here are your headlines from last night's episode. Now, this is, as we were discussing it earlier, it's like... It, this is obviously a young audience that, yeah. that, that they're coming in. When you were talking about at the beginning, that yeah. the growth is in the young audience. You'd, uh, you'd like a piece of that because obviously Radio 1, it's, it's tough for them to keep a traditional mm. youth audience. So it's a big part of your strategy. You'd love to do something like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd like, to, I'd like to basically enter that space in a way that's kind of useful in a way. I, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's a, a complicated space, actually, really. In fact, one of the first and most thorny conversations I had in the BBC was about TV companion pieces and how you exploit that. And I actually think that the most important thing is you really need to add, add value. You know, um, If you're just tagging something on the end of it, it, it isn't going to work. Um, and Love Island, uh, it was unbelievably fun and engaging and it made sense it made sense in, in connection with that particular proposition but um, there is a danger for TV companions to sort of like do what I tried to ape the podcast world okay TV, TV discussions and obsessions is a huge part of the podcast world it makes up a huge amount of traffic and it's it's joy is it's unbelievably geeky and nerdy and it's also open and free so it can both love and loathe certain things and I think for companion pieces that attach to a big product it's a it's a very subtle balance to get that right which is you know 
you don't want to commission a podcast where that you invite a lot of people in and then they just like tear the program apart, but it should have the freedom to do that. So uh, you have to right. judge it. In this case, there was just like a win-win. You know, it's not about being critical. It's just about loving it and adding more super serving loyal fans and all that. And so it was such a, a sweet spot, you know. Um, so I would love that, but it'll probably be more complicated for me to make that kind of hit than it is for ITV. How, how old are your audience, James, would you say? Who are uh, they? Yeah, under 35. Is are they? Of our, and skewed slightly female, I think. Yeah, less uh, so than it used to, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, so sort of let's see what TV can learn from, from podcasting. And you've touched on it, James, but, um, you know, you're in an interesting position. You've, you've got porno going on, but in your day job, you're sort of selling uh, TV ideas. So what are the sort of big learnings that can, can, can come from this, do you think? Is it, is it just about trying out ideas cheaply or what, what are the sort of format things or the tonal things? You, you yeah, no, I think um, TV should be and probably is looking towards that space to see, to find new talent and to find new ideas. And like, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot happening now with um, networks buying shows and putting them on TV. And I think if, if you're going to do that, you have to think, how will it be? Because I've seen some shows where they literally film them recording a podcast. And it's like, if you're going to make that transfer of a podcast to screen, it does need to be thought about how, how you do that. Um, so, yeah, I just think there's a kind of a wealth of new talent on there. It's authentic content as well. And that's nice. Like it's, it's people who know about what they're talking about for whatever reason. You know, ours is Jamie's dad did genuinely write an erotic novel. Um, <laughs> And I think that's a big appeal of it. It, it. Podcasts are great at building communities and audiences around shows and making them feel like they're part of a gang. I think it's part of the intimacy of like putting a show in your ears um, and feeling like you're the only one listening to it. Um, that's one of the, kind of my favourite things about the show is the fact that yeah, it does feel like a real community and and you can have that real direct relationship with your audience. Um, and I've run out of things. Okay, what if, so <laughs> I'm. I know that you will have had a, a kind of line of all kinds of people at your door saying, can we turn this into TV or mm. movie or whatever? Well, tell us, give us an exclusive. What, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, well, we're having US conversations, actually. Last year, we were kind of developing... We actually tried to do the show. Uh, we tried to do a pilot, and it, it just didn't work at the time. It didn't feel right. Um, but now, yeah, we've kind of develop, developed the conversations over in America. We, and we talk, because the thing is, it could be quite a few things. So we've talked about like a scripted version of it, uh, animation, um, all sorts of things. So yeah, we're having conversations. And on Monday, hopefully, we're announcing, we are doing something for TV in the US that we're announcing on Monday. Might as well do it now. <laughs> no, I can't. We haven't signed. Okay. It's the weekend. No one's going to write it. <laughs> um, uh, Susie, I know you, you actually feel, um, in terms of, it, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's not a mistake that the, these guys came from TV. No, not, not at all. Yeah. And um, I genuinely think some of the best ideas and <laughs> strategies come from produ TV producers, script writers, particularly around script to comedy, drama. Um, that's, you know, bread and butter for, for TV. We don't have it in podcasting. We need people with those ideas to come test, test out their ideas fund it through advertising and then possibly sell back to TV. There's huge gaps in the podcast landscape at the moment. Um, and I see TV people coming in with just very clear sense of a pitch, a very clear sense of format, a very clear idea on branding, and a thought through strategy on how they will engage an audience. Um, those aren't necessarily skills that the radio community have always had to worry about. So I, I feel like you can get some fantastic um, talent coming from TV. Um, it's a, and it's a, it's a cr becoming a crowding, crowded market, isn't it? So a lot of podcasts. purity of idea and talent are very important. Yeah, yeah. So we get pitched a lot of the same ideas, same formats, deriv derivative formats. Really, now you do need to think of a very, very clear original idea or, a, you know, a, a very clear angle or a very fresh voice. And you really got to think about your branding and marketing as well. It's not it's not just come up with a lovely interview format and you're going to have yeah. a successful show. In, in the 70s and 80s, everyone had a novel in them and now everybody has a podcast. Like, yeah. you know, it usually <laughs> involves them talking to their mates about things that really interest them, which is, which is great and that works. 
when it has something as, as wonderful as my dad wrote a porno, but it has to have a higher bar. And I think from my perspective, commissioning, the, the, the commissioning ask would be quite high and I really do want things worked out. Also, podcasting is, is very interesting in a sense, very digitally native in the sense that you really kind of have to have an idea of who your audience are. I mean, they might be you, but at least you have to have a vision of that. It informs everything you do as you evolve it. And often people and the indie sector have just like lobbed ideas into sort of like commissions because the network the identity is wrapped up in the network and it has its own kind of energy and sort of it has its own I ideal and you can just pin it and that's it and you don't have to think about it. Where I think the creative channel challenge is to, is to really think digitally about it, like really target where you want to be and who you think you can make a great product for and a great sort of experience for. Okay, um, we've got five minutes left. I'm going to use a few of these questions. The, the, at the end, someone's asked if you could all make a, a recommendation for a favourite podcast at the moment. Ooh. So be, be thinking about that. Interesting one here about sort of just quickly the sort of technical side of it because you know you're saying it's good, you know, garage band, you know, <laughs> kitchen table, but actually the conversation we were having is like actually some of this stuff. It, you're, you've got your headphones on. Everyone's got decent headphones now. Audio quality really matters, does it? Doesn't it? It does to some people, but I mean, I think it depends what it is. I mean, I think if it's terrible quality, then yeah, that's a problem. But um, if it's just people talking, it doesn't. You know. <laughs> some people will always complain about everything, even when you've got like I've got I've got actual professional people working on my podcast, and you still get people complaining about the sound quality. Some people, some people just want to, but. But some of the built stuff coming out of America. I think it does. It does if it serves the story, and and it doesn't if the story just doesn't need it. In yeah. yeah. Sense. Well, sometimes it's it. if it's raw, if it's yeah. just, you know, if it's yeah, yeah. people around a table. Yeah, sometimes the, the rawness of, of it too. is the feel of it. Yeah. You know, so I think it it's up to you. I think the you know the new podcast coming out. Uh, yeah, my wife's doing one, and they've done trailers for it, and it sounds like you know just <laughs> amazingly professional. So yeah, there's, there's I think you you probably have to start thinking about those things if you if you want to make a splash from a, a brand new podcast. Mm. Yeah, I mean, are you, do you sort of knowingly maintain the sort of slightly lo-fi? Yeah, we've been offered to record it in studios and stuff like that, but we, I mean, the whole point is that we're supposed to be just getting together as friends and having dinner and then talking about this book, so we always want to do it like that, plus it's easier and I don't have to leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question here, uh, I think it was about, you know, James and Richard both had media profiles or connections, as did Scroobius Pip, Adam Buxton. How can you break through if you're non-industry at the outset. So is it possible, do you yeah. think, for yeah, yeah. people with no profile? I mean, you, yeah. you guys were, were relatively, you know. You, yeah, and I, I don't think we, that we, we really exploited that at all when we started out, you know. The, the, it would literally, we put it out, we didn't really tell anyone, any of our friends we were doing it or anything like so. But I think a lot of people think our success has come because we're connected and we're in the media, but it really wasn't. It was, we just put it out. And I think if your content's good and you have an idea that cuts through, people will find it. It's quite a democratized space. The chart is still the best place for, um, for discovering stuff. Um, so I think I just think if it's good enough, people will find it and they'll tell people is about it. Is that true? So is I it think still it is democratic? True. I do think it's hard, um, but and I think it takes a bit longer. But word of mouth is still the number one way to discover podcasts. So it is still about producing something great and telling your friends. Um, the podcast press has become more engaged. So most of the major newspapers now talk about podcasts, review podcasts, have pieces on podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, Cross-promoting with other shows, very, very important. Um, working with other podcasters, big or small, have them talk about you, you talk about them. Something we try and pair people up at ACAST to help build the community up. Um, and yeah, focus on your branding. Conversely, also, when I started out, there was in the 1990s, 1980s, there was no way of getting your stuff out unless you got a broadcaster to put you out. Yeah. And now you can do, you know, two years of training to make a radio show without anyone you know it's kind of good for people not to hear the early ones you can just keep putting something out get better and better and then if, if it's good then people will listen to it I don't you know I don't with Adam as well I don't think my my profile was pretty low I think in terms of you know I don't think it, it was it didn't harm me that few people knew who I was but it, it, but like I was touring and 50 people were paying to come and see me so you know I wasn't like that high high up in terms of profile so I think it's just about you know, making you making your mark and finding something original now. I think it, you know, as with all these things, the more people that do it, the harder it is to get noticed. I think it has to be really authentic, and there's no point in sort of. I think if you cynically go in and think I'm going to have a TV career and I'm going to make this podcast, it's not going to work. I think you really have to love the medium a bit, and I think certain kinds of voices really are enhanced by podcasts because complicated. The you know the geeks have won. The geeks have taken over in the podcast space, <laughs> and that's a really good thing. Yeah, but I, but I also think a lot of people have to. You have to sort of think about how you define success because it is kind of digitally native form it has it has the kind of big 
it's a little niche. And if, if you're making a podcast for, uh, you know, sort of um, Asian fishing enthusiasts and you're getting 30,000 downloads and that's the core community of that, that's a massive, massive success. It just, I think it's, I think everyone look, sometimes looks for happy numbers and I understand why, but actually if you're making it just a brilliant uh, podcast that really hits your core community and sustains you and adds something to you, that's fine. You know, if you can get 3,000 people to pay you know, a pound a month yeah. or whatever, you've yeah, got an actually viable career. So you don't need to get a massive amount of people, you just need to get uh, people who are committed to you. And so that's what's interesting about it, I think. So a niche thing can become a, a big, it's a worldwide audience, mm. yeah. which was not the case, you know? So everyone in the world, you just need to find those, if you can find the 3,000, 5,000 people who'll just chip in or will pay, buy, buy your book or whatever, you're, you're kind of golden, you know. Yeah, and you guys, as one of you was saying when we were chatting, that that's the nature of the medium. It can be very niche, it can be very big. Yeah. Right, we're just going to finish, got to finish, but just from each of you, maybe like a prediction for the kind of next year or so of podcasting, where you think that where things might go, what audiences, how it might grow, whatever. And then also just very quickly rec recommend a, a podcast that you think people should listen to. Start, let's go. Um, so I'll recommend a really bizarre podcast and you have to speak German. <laughs> but it, it illustrates actually the hyper niche of things, which is, uh, it's called Ton, Tonbank Berlin. And if you speak German, it's just two of the funniest, sweetest people in the world sitting on a bench in Berlin, talking about ice cream in a, in a way that's so quintessentially German. And that's the beauty of podcasting, because I can't think of any other place where this bizarre aspect of my background, which is I'm a German speaker and I, it's a city I know, would be, you know, I can find it. I discovered it uh, about two or three weeks ago. It's only got 24 episodes. Um, they, I, I messaged them actually and they haven't even got back to me, so I don't even know whether they're You binged a lot in two weeks. I've binged, I think I've listened to everything and it's just phenomenal and it so super serves this weird okay. part of me. Is that also your prediction for the mass market? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think <laughs> Tom Bank Berlin is the next big, big thing. What, what, I, what I do think, the next, well, I mean, I think there's going to be a bum fight for content um, and exclusives, and probably the announcement on Monday will indicate that. I think the Americans are coming over, and I think the British creative sector needs to get its fucking shit together and start to support creative voices and take some risks. And uh, the, the other thing I have to say, which is, you know, podcasts are great in themselves. They have their own particularities. Like, I think we're going to realize that we're not, it's not just a way to sort of like advertise things or, or just build things to another medium. It has its own integrity and its own creative kind of direction. Okay, Susie? Um, I would really recommend The Tip Off. This is a show by a wonderful investigative journalist called Maeve McClenaghan, and she looks at a big breaking news story and she speaks to the journalist that broke that story and how they pieced it together and she goes right back. She's a gifted storyteller and it's a fascinating way to kind of unravel how stories break through. So I would really recommend that. And also, dear Joan and Jerrica. Oh, yeah. Sorry, James. Um, I mean, just it's unbelievable. Genius. Two two fantastic comedians really inappropriate and filthy, but I love Fantastic, it. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And your prediction, our prediction? Oh, um, I think next year will be all about um, the voice. I think smart speakers are changing things for sort of major publishers in, in this space. So I think that's going to transform um, us from talking just about podcasts, talking much more about audio, more generally, um, and loads more women. Hooray. <laughs> James, why don't you predict where porno is going to end up on TV? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you stole my recommendation. I, I also like. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, Pod Save America. I'm a big American politics fan, so this is a podcast where three. I think one of them was a former uh, speechwriter for Obama. They every twice a week they discuss what's happening with Trump and kind of help present it in an understandable way and contextualise things, and that's really good. And as far as predictions, I, I hope we get more like big British hits. Like I, we're all, we've been saying, like what's the new porno? What's ne what's going to take our crown? We'd welcome that. Like we're, like, mm. it'll, and now that kind of there's more investment in it and people are taking it more seriously, hopefully there'll, there'll be more to compete with the American shows a bit more. That'd be nice. And more uh, TV sh channels probably optioning stuff. And yeah, sure. so, there's already they're already making waves obviously in that space, but it feels like that's going to happen more and more. Richard. 
Um, yeah, I've made a lot of mine are gone, but uh, All Killer No Filler is a fantastic podcast, which again is comedians, two, fan, you know, two fantastic younger female comedians uh, sort of getting out and doing it themselves. And I think that's sort of what's interesting from my point of view anyway, and maybe from a comedian's point of view, is that you can start something up and do it yourself and build an audience. They're touring the world. They're, you know, they're, them and the guilty feminists, I think, have realised, like, in terms of Edinburgh, you come up here and you're sell, that you're selling out and... Mm. Um, so you know, there's 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 lots of great stuff to look out for. But I, I'm re- you know I'm very interested in the comedians doing it for themselves still, in spite of everything else that's going on. Though you know, it's it's very interesting that everyone's get, getting behind podcasts in, in such a way. So you know, that's it's a it's, it's a very fruitful area, I think, for uh, for creativity. Hopefully, thank you very much. I think uh, incredible panel. Really appreciate them coming up or hanging around to do this. Uh, Panel, thank you for being here. Please thank Jason Phipps, Susie Warhouse, James Cooper, Richard Herring. Thank you very much.